If you want in an all-rounder, emulation-focused handheld, then there's a ton of options out there. But I feel like almost every single one of them are flawed in some way that forces you to compromise in a certain area. So for me, it's probably worth spending a little bit extra to get a full-on handheld PC. This opens up the library of games you can access massively, gives you a bigger form factor which is probably going to be more comfortable than a cheaper alternative, and it's going to have more power, meaning you you can emulate even beyond the PS2 and GameCube with ease. And that brings me to today's sponsor, Lenovo, who were kind enough to send us the brand new Lenovo Legion Go S, which is the newest model in the Legion Go series. But what's different here, and is it actually worth picking up as an all-in-one emulation machine? Let's take a look. When you get your Lenovo Legion Go S, you're gonna get the device itself, a charger, and that's kind of it. It's a bit of a shame that it doesn't come with a case, but it does come with this cardboard kickstand, so at least you get something extra. In all seriousness though, you don't really need any extra goodies here because the device itself looks incredibly impressive when you take it out of the box. The modern and sleek white shell looks great and matches the aesthetic of the PS5, and we've got some nice details like the texture on the grip area, and the Lenovo Legion branding on the back of the device. Not to mention the glaringly obvious massive 8-inch display on offer here, which immediately makes the Go S look super impressive. In terms of inputs, we've got all of the usual standard controller stuff. Two Hall Effect sticks, action buttons in the Xbox layout, start and select buttons, and you've got the back bumpers and analog triggers. Interestingly, the triggers have these little switches next to them, which allow you to change them from analog ones to digital ones by physically stopping them from being pulled all the way down. In terms of retro gaming use cases, this is actually a nice feature, because most consoles older than the Dreamcast didn't have analog triggers, so it feels much more natural with digital ones for those older systems. But then, if you want to play something more modern, you can instantly swap back to the analog style whenever you want. This is actually a really cool feature, and it's something I've never seen on another handheld before. On the top of the device we've got two USB-C ports which is handy if you need to charge it and use a peripheral at the same time. We've also got a headphone jack, volume buttons and a power button. Finally on the bottom of the console we've got a micro SD card port so that you can expand the storage on offer. All standard stuff so far but now let's have a look at some of the more quirky elements of the device. Firstly, we've got these two handy additional back buttons tucked away towards the centre of the device, which are easy to press if you need them, but out of the way enough that I never found myself accidentally hitting them. These can be set as hotkeys to have quick access to emulator settings like save states or fast forward, which is super handy. We've also got this tiny mouse trackpad, which is useful for navigating the OS, but the vibrating haptic feedback here is way too powerful for its own good, with it being obnoxiously loud. Loud. Luckily though, you can easily turn this off in the settings menu, but still, why is it like this? Obviously, we've also got a touch screen here, so you probably won't even need to use the trackpad anyway, but it's nice to have both options available to you. We've also got two additional menu buttons above start and select, with the one on the left activating the Lenovo space front end, and the one on the right giving you access to the sidebar interface, where you can toggle the performance modes, see CPU and GPU usage, and activate a frame rate counter, which is extremely useful for making sure your games are as optimised as possible. Possible. The final thing worth pointing out is the D-pad, which is this circular plate style one, which aren't normally my favourites, but this one is actually pretty good, with it snapping into the cardinal directions to give you a great degree of accuracy. For those of you that are familiar with the original Legion Go, the main difference that you'll notice straight away is that the Go S doesn't have detachable controllers, instead going for the more standard all-in-one unit. These detachable controllers were pretty cool, but in terms of actual practicality, I probably prefer just having a more straightforward attached controller like this. If you wanted to do any multiplayer stuff or connect it to an external display, you can obviously still do that by connecting standard controllers to it anyway, so it's not like you're losing out on any features by having this more traditional design. In terms of the feel of the device in the hands, I have to say that it's very, very good. It weighs 
1.61 pounds, which is fairly heavy, but they've done a great job distributing the weight here, so it actually feels much lighter than that, without feeling too light that it comes across as flimsy. All in all, the ergonomics and inputs on offer here are pretty much perfect, and so far, I can see this being a very good option for one hell of an emulation powerhouse. But I think that's enough talking about the outside of this thing. It looks great, but it's time to dive a little bit deeper and take a look at some specs. The Lenovo Legion Go S is in a little bit of a strange place at the moment because there's actually a couple of versions of it that aren't out yet and these will make it the first third party handheld to ship preloaded with Steam OS. But the version I have here is the standard Windows 11 one which has 32 gigs of RAM, whereas one of the upcoming Steam OS versions will have 16 gigs of RAM and the same Z2 Go chipset which is in my version of the device. The other Steam OS version will have 32 gigs of RAM and the more powerful Z1 Extreme chipset. To make things even more confusing, there's also currently a 16 gig of RAM Windows 11 version, and I kinda wonder if they should have cut this selection down a bit and just had two models. A 32 gig of RAM with Windows 11 and a 32 gig of RAM with Steam OS that both have the Z1 Extreme chipset and both released at the same time to avoid all of this completely unnecessary confusion. All of that nonsense aside though, purely looking at the specs of this particular version of the Go S that I have here, let's break the specs down. We've got the AMD Ryzen Z2 Go chipset with integrated AMD Radeon graphics, 32 gigs of RAM, a 1TB SSD and a 55 watt per hour battery. The OS is Windows 11, there's Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.3 connectivity, and it also comes with a year of Legion Ultimate support and three months of Xbox PC Game Pass, which is an awesome extra. These specs sound quite fancy when you're reading them out, but this is actually one of the weaker handheld PCs on the market right now. Not only is it less powerful than some of the competition, but it's even technically inferior to the original model Lenovo Legion Go. But I would argue that the ergonomics offered by the Go S are superior, and I personally prefer the look of the Go S too, but that is probably just a matter of preference. Something that does beat a lot of the competition though is this screen. It's an 8 inch 1920 by 1200 resolution display with an aspect ratio of 16 by 10. It has a refresh rate of 120Hz and goes up to 500 nits of brightness. Looking at the display here, you would think it was an OLED, but it's actually not. It's just a very, very nice LCD, which honestly easily looks as good as, if not better, than a lot of OLED screens that I've seen in the past. The sheer size of the display and the fact it's a full HD resolution means that you're going to be able to massively upscale retro content and it's going to look absolutely phenomenal. But as we all know, the setting up process on handhelds running Windows 11 can be a bit of a nightmare. So, has anything been done to streamline this? Well, no, not really. When you boot the device up, it's just the standard Windows interface, and you're gonna need to do all of the stupid signing in stuff, getting rid of the bloatware that still comes pre-installed on Windows for some reason, and then mess about customising everything to make it look less cluttered. This isn't really a fault of the Legion Go S, it's just Windows itself being poorly optimised for all of the different devices that exist nowadays. Once you've done all of that though, Windows actually becomes somewhat of a positive thing simply because everything will be compatible with it. In terms of my setup here, I'm mostly going to be running games through Steam Big Picture mode so that things feel a little bit more console-like, and I've also installed all of my emulation software through EmuDeck, which is an absolutely amazing piece of software that will download and configure individual emulators to your specific device's hardware, and even give you easy access to a front end like Emulation Station, and then it connects all of this stuff together pretty seamlessly. Now another option would be to install something like Bazai, which is an OS that aims to mimic Steam OS, but I feel like that's probably a bit advanced, and I want to stick to making things as easy as possible. There's some emulators that do need need further tinkering beyond this, like PS1 and PS2 needing the BIOS files, Switch needing product keys and title keys, Wii, Wii U and 3DS benefiting from creating a me character, and there's bound to be other stuff with other emulators that need tweaking too. 
But again, this stuff is always going to need to be tinkered with on any device because emulation software developers can only do so much without bumping into copyright protection laws. So yeah, the setting up process here is a little bit messy, but at the end of the day, we still have a handheld that's quite powerful, especially for emulation. It's also got great ergonomics and an amazing screen, so I think it's about time that we test out some games. Something I want to point out is that because the screen is 16x10, 4x3 content looks amazing here because we've got a little bit more vertical space to work with, which makes the black bars on the sides of the gameplay appear smaller than they would on a standard 16x9 display. Plus, because the screen is a huge 8 inches at 1920 by 1200 resolution, you're definitely going to be able to take full advantage of upscaling across every retro system. Any 2D retro content from stuff like the SNES or the Mega Drive and anything before that is going to work absolutely perfectly upscaled to 1080p and these games are rarely going to pop because of the quality of the display. The D-pad being great here also helps make these games feel incredible too and I can easily see myself playing a lot of SNES stuff on this device. The early 3D systems once again are going to perform flawlessly upscaled to 1080p, so PS1 and N64 and Dreamcast are all fully playable here and you can take full advantage of any analog stick or analog trigger functionality these systems had, which effectively gives the device 100% compatibility across every single game on these systems. Moving up to the consoles that most cheaper Android or Linux based handhelds struggle with, I'm happy to say that PS2 and GameCube performance is absolutely perfect even with a 1080p upscale. Even F-Zero GX runs at a full 60 frames per second, and if you're looking for a console to immerse yourself in this generation of games, the Legion Go S has you covered. I feel like this is the generation of games where some handheld screen sizes are a little bit too small, but having this huge display is a real bonus for this era of games, and anything more modern too. To take full advantage of some of the more demanding games from this generation though, you're probably going to want to boost the performance mode up to the performance setting. This will allow the Legion Go S to use all of its power in order to get the best frame rates from your games as possible, with the disadvantage being a drop in battery life and the fans becoming much louder. The problem here is that the fans can actually get to a point where they're so loud that it becomes distracting. Even if you turn the volume way up, you can still hear them over the game audio, so if you're playing this in public, you might want to stick to those less demanding games, or somebody might think you're about to blast into the sky with your jetpack. Moving on up to the even more demanding emulation stuff that's really only possible on handheld PC devices at this point, let's test out PS3, Wii U and Switch performance. Starting with PS3, I have to say that things here are really good. PS3 emulation is still in its relatively early stages, but it's quickly improving and becoming much more viable on these slightly lower end devices. Games like Demon's Souls and Ratchet and Clank Tools of Destruction are very playable even with the frame rates being boosted beyond what was possible on original hardware. I would have appreciated a setting on the Go S that quickly capped the frame rate of games here though, because Demon's Souls was running pretty solidly at around 40 frames per second in 720p, but sometimes went into the high 50s and this made things feel a little bit inconsistent. For games like these I would actually rather just cap it at 40 to make things feel smoother overall. Wii U emulation just always seems to end up impressing me with just how great it is. Everything I tested ran flawlessly on the Go S, and revisiting some of these Wii U exclusives in a new format like this always makes me think about how the Wii U is a little bit underrated. Switch wise, I want to avoid showing any first party stuff because Nintendo don't like that, but I did test out a certain popular kart racer and it ran in a highly playable state, but it was dropping frames every now and then. I did find that things did smooth out over time, so it seems that after the shaders have been cached, performance is improved, but it's still not absolutely perfect. Less demanding indie games run like a dream though, but for the vast majority of these, you might as well just get the native PC versions because they'll most likely perform better at higher resolutions. I mean, this is a handheld PC after all. 
And this brings me on to the next option that you have to play retro games on this device, which is much more simple to set up. And that is to use the included 3 month subscription of PC Game Pass, which offers a small selection of retro re-releases that you can dive into with no extra charge. Admittedly though, the amount of retro content provided on this service seems to be very minimal, but it is an option if there's something there that you want to play. A lot of people have been complaining about the battery life on this device, and while it isn't amazing and it will die very quickly if you're playing anything like Elden Ring or other fairly recent AAA games, on the emulation side of things it's actually quite decent. With PS2 and GameCube you're going to get around 2 hours on performance mode, with Switch, PS3 and Wii U this is dropped to around an hour and a half, and with anything before the Dreamcast on the power saving mode you're going to get around 4 hours of gameplay off of a full charge. So after all of this testing and weighing up the positives and negatives, is the Lenovo Legion Go S worth picking up as an emulation device? This is a great device for emulation, there's a couple of little things that stop it from being perfect, mostly coming down to that fan noise when you crank up the performance settings and the clunky Windows setting up process, but there's also a lot it gets right. The screen, ergonomics and the look of the Go S are all phenomenal and the performance is extremely impressive all the way up to PS2, GameCube and Wii U, with it also being capable of great results from PS3 and Switch. These positives alone make the Legion Go S an extremely appealing console that I'm definitely going to continue to use in the future. The major sticking point though is the price. In the UK, this particular model of the Legion Go S costs £649.99. The thing is, is that the upcoming lower end Steam OS version of the Go S, which releases in May, is going to cost around £399.99, which makes it instantly much more attractive because not only is it cheaper, but it's also going to have a much more streamlined and user friendly OS which instantly eliminates one of my biggest negative points with the model I'm holding here. In fact this £399.99 price tag brings it into direct competition with the Steam Deck, with it being smack in the middle of the 256GB LCD version and the 512GB OLED version, which is a great place to position yourself in the market with a device like this. So I guess my advice here is to either wait a little bit longer until the Steam OS versions come out, or if you really prefer Windows as your OS then the current Legion Go S is very good and will most likely meet all of your emulation needs even if it is a little bit expensive. But what do you think of the Lenovo Legion Go S from an emulation standpoint? Are you tempted to pick one of these up to use as an all-in-one console, or are you going to be testing out some PC games on it? Let me know down in the comments, and also remember to give the video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe to see more retro content and handheld coverage coming very soon in the future. I've been Rob from Retro Dodo, and I'll see you in the next one.